This one, great. Just okay, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all of you, and welcome to this uh, side event on um, advancing wastewater monitoring at the local level and uh, monitoring of uh, SDG indicator 6.3.1. My name is Lars Stordal, and on behalf of the um, uh, host of the Congress at GWAPA, um, I'm sending you greetings from the UN campus in Bonn. Um, very happy to have our um, uh, partners uh, with us today, um, uh, World Health Organization and the UN Statistics Division, as well as the city of uh, New York. Um, before we start, I would just like to go through um, a couple of housekeeping issues. There is a uh, chat, uh, a public chat on the on the right hand side um, uh, at the bottom where you can raise questions and issues for discussion. Uh, we also have interpretation in this uh, event um, into French and Spanish by uh, use of the of the buttons um, up on the up on, up on the right hand side. Please also leave us um, uh, your feedback um, by responding to the survey, um, the session evaluation survey at the bottom, at the very bottom of the page. So um, without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to the moderator of, of the event, um, Mr. Florian Thevenon, which is, um, who is with us in, in UN Habitat. Uh, Florian, over to you. Thank you very much, Lars, for this introduction. Uh, maybe I, I could ask Kive to share my, the, the presentation because there is a, an introduction page with the agenda. So uh, my name is Florian Tivnon. I'm consultant for UN Habitat. I'm based in Geneva. I'm very happy to be with you today. So the first one, yes. And um, first, I would like also to thank the organizer because that's uh, an amazing congress. That's uh, my first participation and. I, I follow most of the session and learn a lot. It was really uh, exhaustive, exhausting, interesting, and uh, this sharing of uh, good practices and knowledge and uh, the regional approach and all the theme, uh, climate change, disaster, water scarcity, that's really, really interesting and how uh, we should deal uh, with water. So uh, by the end of this session, I hope that you will uh, know everything about the indicator 631. We have the chance to have the three custodian agencies today, UNSD, Habitat, and WHO. And since this, uh, this Congress is dedicated to uh, water operator, we are also very lucky to have uh, the contribution from New York City Department of Environmental Protection, Dimitris Catris. And I, I especially thank them because uh, with uh, Schwann, they are, in, they are in New York, so it's quite early and uh, it's very, uh, their presence is really appreciated. So this session is only one hour, so I won't speak uh, too much. We are all uh, aware about the importance of wastewater. Uh, it's not uh, waste, it's really water and a, a precious, uh, crucial resource that uh, we should improve the, its management and therefore do some improve the monitoring. And you will see in my presentation that there is a, a, a yeah, I will say even dramatic lack of uh, wastewater data at the global level, uh, but also the importance of uh, water utility in providing so, so, so wastewater data. So utility are really a crucial role to play in, in helping us to improving the number of reporting country and um, the quality and quantity of data. And we all know uh, that it's crucial to, to adapt uh, to climate change crisis, to the water pollution crisis, uh, we saw many presentations this morning on, on reuse in water scarce region, but it is concerning everyone. And that's also great again to have a, a, a testimony from New York City because uh, to, to manage uh, so water at this scale is also very interesting. Okay, so as uh, Lars says, there is a the chat box to address your comment and questions that will be addressed at the end. We have four, four presentations of about 10 minutes. so. We should have time to address them. Please do not hesitate. And uh, without further details, I will uh, give the floor to, to Schwann, if he's ready to, to share his screen. Schwann, can, can you hear us? Ah, yes, great. Thank you. We see it. If you can put on a slide mode. 
Okay, uh, can you hear me, Florian? Yes, very well. We don't see the slide mode, but it happened to me, so I don't know if you can, if it's, if you already click on it or not. Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Okay, you. great. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Juan I'm from the Environment Statistics section of United Nations Statistics Division, UNSD. And I'll be happy to talk about our water data collection questionnaire, especially um, the data related to wastewater this um, today with you. So my brief presentation will be short. The outline will include three parts. First, the introduction of the UNSD UNEP joint questionnaire. And second part is to um, give some examples of how can the data we collect inform key policy questions on wastewater policy and some concluding remarks. So for firstly, I would like to give an introduction of our UNSD UNEP questionnaire. So since 1999, we have been collaborating with the UN Environment Program to collect water and waste data. So we have two questionnaires, one for water and one for waste. This is mandated by the UN Statistical Commission in 1995 and 2003. So the questionnaire are sent to the National Statistical Offices, the NSO of each member state of the UN and the Ministry of Environment. However, they are not sent to Eurostat and OECD member states because we co also collaborate closely with Eurostat and OECD, and they are responsible for collecting water and waste data from their own members. So the latest re uh, collecting cycle is 2020. We sent the questionnaire to about 170 member states, and the response rate is typically hovering around 50% this year um, because of the pandemic. I think a lot of the country NSOs and ministries are um, delaying their response. So we are slowly getting more and more uh, response as of we speak now. Um, the, the, the collection cycles is every two years. So the latest cycle is 2020 and the previous one is 2018, 2016. So only on the even years we collect the, the water and waste data. And at UNSD, we do not have any imputation nor do we estimate any data. So all the data are official data from the country. So what do we do when we have the data? We um, evaluate them, validate them, and put them into one of these outputs. So the first output we have is called UNSD Environment Indicators. These are the time series tables or the latest year available data for a selected number of indicators in particular to wastewater. These are the five following indicators that we uh, disseminate on our website, wastewater generated and wastewater generated and treatment, and then treated in independent treatment facility, in other treatment plants, and in urban wastewater treatment plants. We also produce country file, which is basically the country reply for each of the water and waste questionnaires. The third output we provide is the country snapshot, which is, is a, um, a kind of a comprehensive overview of each individual country's data spanning many different thematic topics and areas. And finally, we also do tailored uh, responses. Uh, some key stakeholders or um, users will request certain type of data, and we can always pull data from our database or generate something um, particular for those queries. Um, I want to give you an example of here is uh, at the first title page of the example water questionnaire. As you can see, we have six tables, five of them including uh, data. Uh, first table is on renewable freshwater resource, that's table W1 and followed by freshwater abstraction and use, and water supply industry, wastewater generation and treatment. This is a one of main concern for this talk, and the population connected to wastewater treatment. And for this questionnaire, what we illustrate here is in English, but we also have the questionnaire in 
four other UN languages, including French, Spanish, Russian, and Arabic. Particular for the wastewater table, we have a total of about 20 indicators that we collect data from. As you can see on the right-hand side of the table, total wastewater generated and disaggregations. And also from line 10, we have wastewater treated in different type of facilities and their, um, and their volume. We also collect data on non-treated wastewater and sewage sludge production. We collaborate very closely with Eurostat and OECD, as I mentioned before, because they collect data from their own member state. And also with WHO and UN Habitat, we work closely on the terminologies and methodologies regarding to aspect of wastewater generation and treatment. We hold monthly meeting with our um, partner agencies and uh, this meeting has proved to be very helpful and useful to um, produce this data and to um, harmonize the approach that um, uh, we approach countries so we don't burden the country with multiple different uh, requests or unnecessary um, burdens. And these, lastly, I would like to mention that these data collected will help us inform key policy questions such as those related to SDG 6.3.1 proportion of domestic and industrial wastewater safely treated. Um, here you can see a chart that illustrated our data availability. So basically the curve shows that if there's a decrease of uh, data availability as time progresses. This means that the data are coming um, relatively at a lower speed to us. We always have more data availability in previous years, as you can see here. Um, for instance, the or orange line, the first one is the number of countries providing us data with wastewater treating urban wastewater treatment plants. In 2018 and 19, on the most right-hand side, we only collect data for one round of data collection in 2020. That's why the data availability is quite low. But as you can, as you go back in time in 2016 and 17, we collect data from two rounds from the country in 2018 and 20. And in 1915, we collect them three rounds in 2016, 18, and 20. So that's why the data significantly improved. So this is to demonstrate that the collection of data takes time and uh, we're working on improving the later year data right now. The second part is to show some uh, examples on how our data can help to inform key wastewater policy questions. For instance, here's one of the output that we created um, based on the data from wastewater generated in each country. So as you can see, there's a huge variation between the uh, water gener wastewater generated because understandably countries of different size on the uh, further furthest right hand side you have Brazil followed by Egypt Ukraine they generate a huge amount of wastewater and on the right hand side there's a smaller size country Andorra Albania Monaco, Monaco and Bermuda that generate far less wastewater and I have to mention that um, this is actually the, the scale is log scale. So if you put it into the uh, normal linear scale, the, the difference is much, is much larger, but it's difficult to see from the, power, from the chart. Uh, on the other side of the story, uh, we can also see how much wastewater is treated. The proportion of domestic wastewater treated um, uh, in terms of wastewater generated, there's also a huge uh, variation between Andorra, uh, all the way to Cuba. Some country treated 100% of the data, some country produce and treat um, 30%. Uh, I, I I'll I will try to be quick and just come to the concluding remarks that we would like to point out that UNSD is maintaining, maintaining an open relationship with key stakeholders. Um, and this is a vital to continue the improvement. 
the data on wastewater remains spotty for some variables, and uh, we take years to um, uh, to fill those spots and the gaps. Um, this year, in past 2020 and 2019, because of the travel restriction, we have not been able to collaborate uh, physically, but most of the effort on wastewater treatment is done uh, virtually. At international level, as we have spoken before, we have regular teleconference with all key uh, partners. In the On the country level, we had about 15 uh, countries attending our video calls and Q&A sessions on wastewater questionnaire. We also have bilateral conference calls. For instance, we had one recently with um, NSOs of Somalia on um, better helping the country offices on collecting um, water and waste data. And as the data, Im as data gradually improve, uh, we hope that um, more citation from key users are expected in both the term of data collection and the methodology advancement of the questionnaires. So I will stop here and thank you very much, moderators. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Sean. It was really a, a nice presentation and very comprehensive. I think it's very important that people know uh, this um, UNSD uh, methodology. I would encourage also participants to go to the UNSD website and download the country file to see uh, if their country are reporting and what kind of data they are reporting. And also on, the, on this file, you have all the, the terminology, the definition, because it's very important to, to work with standardized definition. You, you can compare different things, methodology, if the definition is clear, otherwise, it's, it's not possible. And uh, I really also thank you uh, because you, you all the time that over the two years you dedicated on this uh, 631 with WHO and inviting us in this meeting with UNSD, uh, with uh, OECD, Eurostat, FAO. And it was very, very important, very interesting. And as you say, you are also managing many, many other uh, environmental statistics. So we are really grateful for that. And uh, you, you mentioned the, the solid waste, which is also used by Habitat for uh, another SDG, SDG 11 on, on, on sustainable city. So uh, thank you very much. You can please ask some uh, question in the chat box to Schwann. And uh, now if uh, you could share my screen, Yve, I will uh, do the, the second presentation on 631 that uh, Schwann already uh, a bit introduced. Can you can you share it? Thank you very much. So the second slide, next one, please. Yes, yeah, so it's about a global uh, reporting, of course, and this presentation is about total and industrial, and Rick will make uh, about the domestic. So next slide, please. Thank you very much. So on the right, you have uh, the SDG six targets. And uh, on the left, the definition of the target 6.3, which is uh, by 2030, improve water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating dumping, and minimizing the release of hazardous chemical and materials, having the proportion of untreated wastewater and substantially increasing recycling and safe reuse globally. Uh, can you click, please? There are two indicators related to this target, 631 on the proportion of wastewater safely treated and 632 on the proportion of bodies of water with good ambient water quality. Next slide, please. Here is a, a representation of the methodology used to monitor indicator 631, focusing on wastewater generated by point sources. The impact of diffuse pollution from non-point sources by runoff is monitored under indicator 632, focusing on ambient water quality. The flow of wastewater generated are disaggregated by sources on the left, whereas the flow of wastewater treated are disaggregated by type and level of treatment, as I will show on the next slide. It is also including the wastewater flow from independent collecting systems, such as septic tanks, that are transported to a treatment plant for safe treatment, as illustrated by uh, the truck here. 
Some of the wastewater is discharged to the environment without treatment, and Siever generally also collects some runoff water. So as Schwann explained, UN Habitat is uh, using this UNSD and also OECD Euros, o, Eurostat uh, data. Um, Habitat is focusing on the total and industrial wastewater statistic using this, their methodology. And these official statistics are supplied by national statistic offices and our Ministry of Environment or equivalent institution. Next slide. Here are the variables used for the generation of wastewater on the left. The industrial fraction is disaggregated by economic activity using the International Standard Industrial Classification of All Economic Activity, ISIC, for mining and quarrying, manufacturing, electricity, but excluding cooling water, of course, and construction. The domestic fraction can be disaggregated by household and services. Agriculture excludes non-point sources such as runoff and irrigation. On the right are reported the variable used for the treatment of wastewater. The other treatment plants include the treatment of wastewater in any non-public treatment plants, for instance, industry, which have their own treatment facilities. The independent treatment facilities are not connected to a wastewater collection system and include septic tank. You can see on the right the breakdown uh, by the three levels of treatment, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Next slide, please, showing the results. This figure presents the volume of wastewater generated from the 56 countries who reported in 2015, which is used as a baseline here, using a, a logarithmic scale. So total volume corresponds to 132 billion cubic meters, which is in fact very, very low. Next slide. This uh, histogram is showing the disaggregation of the flow of wastewater generated by economic activity and household from European members only. Without going in, into details, you can see that countries are not reporting on, on most variable. And there, there is more blue which corresponds to domestic wastewater supply. Next slide. This figure presents the volume treated from the 57 countries who reported in 2015. The total volume corresponds to 42 billion cubic meters, which is also very low. Next slide. The disaggregation for the country reporting to UNSD on wastewater generation also show high heterogeneity in the variable and more data from urbane wastewater treatment plant in blue. So this last uh, few slides highlight the important role, as I said in the introduction, of water utilities in wastewater data monitoring and, and reporting. Next slide. This is the proportion of the total wastewater treated as required for the indicator. There are less countries here than on the previous slide because some countries did not report on both generation and treatment so that the ratio could not be calculated in such cases. Some countries' proportion were higher than 100%, most likely because of an improved monitoring of the wastewater flow treated, especially in municipal wastewater treatment plant, which can also treat an important proportion of runoff water, as well as some wastewater generated from non-public drinking water network. Uh, among the 42 countries here, reporting on both total wastewater generation and treatment, 32% of the wastewater flow receive at least some treatment, whereas the proportion of safely treated wastewater, which means at least secondary treatment in blue, account for 17% based on the 15 countries reporting on secondary treatment to UNSD. Next slide. For the 14 countries only that reported on industrial wastewater generation and treatment, a third of the flow received at least some treatment. <coughs> so, only three countries reported on safely treated industrial wastewater in UNSD in blue. So next slide. A major finding of uh, this report is uh, therefore the low data coverage, which does not allow to provide 
regional and global estimates. This diagram is comparing the volume of wastewater reported in blue on the left with the proportion of the world population covered by the reported data in gray on the right. The 56 and 57 country reporting on total wastewater generation and treatment correspond to 20% of the global population. On the right, the 32 and 50 countries reporting on industrial wastewater flow generation and treatment correspond to only 12 and 3% of the world population. <coughs> Next slide. So in addition to the low number of reporting countries, this figure presenting the water consumption in Switzerland points out the absence of reporting of self-supply water resources in the national statistic, usually, which in general focus on public drinking water supply. As a consequence, the water consumption by economic activities such as trade, industry, and agriculture are in general not included in the annual statistic, while they extract and generate substantial quantity of water and wastewater. Here in Switzerland, over a third of the potable water is used privately, especially by the business and industry sectors, as shown by the uh, longer arrow on the right. Next one. So non-municipal discharges, which include self-supply industry and those that are discharged directly without being collected by sewerage systems, represent a high proportion of total wastewater flow, but also of the pollutant discharged to the environment. This data from Mexico shows that the volume of wastewater generated and treated on the left by municipal and non-municipal sources are in the same order of magnitude. However, on the right, much more biochemical oxygen demand, BOD, which is an indicator of the concentration of organic matter in water, is generated and discharged by non-municipal sources, the light blue, than by municipal sources, the dark blue. Next one. Uh, this figure represents the relative loads of BOD in Costa Rica by economic activities as a percentage of the total BOD related to wastewater discharge. Agriculture and livestock represent 41%, food production 25%, discharge of wastewater and sludge only 12%, retail trade 6%, and other economic activities 17%. This data therefore also demonstrates the importance of filling the existing gaps, data gaps on commercial and industrial wastewater discharge to the environment. Firstly, because industry should represent a much higher proportion of the total wastewater flow. And secondly, because of the important quantity of organic and chemical pollutants that are discharged by industrial activity, which negatively impact ambient water quality and ecosystem health, um, economy, and human health, etc. Uh, next one, to conclude, on the total and industrial uh, wastewater statistic reported by the country to the international database, in 2015, only 42 countries, covering 18% of the global population, reported some statistics on wastewater generation and treatment. This limited data suggests that about a third of the total and industrial wastewater receives some treatment before discharge. On the next slide, I put some uh, links. So all the, the figures that I show come from uh, the indicator report that was launched this summer. You can download it on the UN Water website with all the other indicator report. All the methodology, the metadata, metadata files can be also downloaded online on UNSTAT website. There is a link to the three databases that were used. And uh, the, the last one for on the SDG data portal, where all the data can be also downloaded and visualized uh, with map. So next one is um, finished. Yes. Thank you very much for your attention. And now uh, I will give the floor to uh, Rick Johnson from WHO to do the complementary presentation on the domestic uh, part.
Thank you, Rick. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Florian. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Rick Johnston. I'm with the World Health Organization based in Geneva. Uh, as Florian mentioned, SDG target 6.3 uh, refers to both industrial and domestic wastewater, and for safely treated domestic wastewater, WHO employs a different methodology than the one Florian has prevented for total and industrial wastewater. Basically, we draw on additional data sources and also make use of assumptions to fill data gaps. So the main output of the indicator is the proportion of domestic wastewater safely treated, and it's prevent, presented for countries and territories and can be aggregated to regional and global levels. And in principle, the term domestic uh, should include flows from both households and services such as institutions and businesses that generate similar types of, of, of waste. However, in practice, reporting on flows disaggregated by services uh, is very rare. And therefore, in this report, our estimates cover only household flows. Now, there are four main parts to the methodology shown here in the diagram, and I'll go through those individually. The first step is to determine the total volume of household wastewater generated in a particular country. And that can either be directly reported uh, through some of the questionnaires that Schwann and uh, Florian were referring to, or in the absence of that information, we can uh, estimate it based on the total population and some rules of thumb about domestic water use and the ratio of water use to wastewater produced. In this way, we can produce estimates for household wastewater generation for all of the countries, areas, and territories that the UN Population Division produces population statistics for. Second, um, what we do is we disaggregate the total volume of household wastewater into three separate wastewater streams. Uh, uh, wastewater generated by households who have sewer connections, those who have septic tanks, and those who have all other types of sanitation facilities. And to make this disaggregation, we rely on data uh, from the WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program, which is used for uh, SDG indicator 6.2, uh, safely managed sanitation services. So there's also high data coverage for the distribution of sanitation among the, the population. Next, uh, we estimate the proportion of wastewater flows that are contained, collected at treatment systems, and safely treated within those safe treatment systems for the wastewater streams uh, of representing sewers and septic tanks. Treatment in septic tanks is called treatment in independent treatment plants in those questionnaires uh, shown earlier by Florian and Schwann. Uh, note that wastewater has to be collected uh, for treatment either in a septic tank or in a sewer that connects to a treatment plant. All other wastewater generated, for instance, by households with dry latrines um, is automatically classified as not safely treated. Uh, in terms of the data sources, uh, these data can be reported on those questionnaires from UN Statistics Division or from Eurostat and OECD, but we can also make use of published national data sources, uh, which might come from statistics agencies. You see here the China Statistical Yearbook on the Environment or regulators. We have a nice example from Ireland where the Irish Environmental Protection Agency monitors both uh, waste, uh, centralized and uh, domestic wastewater treatment, or from line ministries and utilities. Um, and you can see an example from Conagua uh, in Mexico, which publishes reports every year um, that we can use for these estimates. So then the different variables representing containment, collection, and treatment are shown here in the house hold wastewater management chain, which is very similar to the diagram that Florian shared earlier, but focusing in on household wastewater. On the left, you can see those three wastewater streams of uh, sewer connections or um, septic tanks or other types of sanitation. Within sewer wastewater, a proportion is collected at wastewater treatment plants, after which a proportion is uh, safely treated before discharge. And by safely treated, we consider that as either meeting discharge compliance standards, uh, or if that data is missing for a country, 
we consider secondary or higher treatment processes for safe treatment. For septic tanks, we can see that the, the proportion of wastes could be delivered to centralized treatment facilities, or a proportion can be treated within the tank uh, system itself. And of course, a proportion might not be adequately treated. So these are also variables uh, which are captured. Finally, for households that have other types of sanitation, all of those wastewater flows are classified as not safely treated. So it's important to note that the country calculations re rely on a number of different variables, and often we don't have nationally representative data for all of them. In, per in particular, it is rare that countries are monitoring on-site sanitation systems like septic tanks, even though it is recognized that a lot of household wastewater is managed directly on site, and also that poor management can negatively impact the environment and public health. So we make use of a set of assumptions to, to uh, use when we're missing data. And we also set some criteria to make sure those assumptions don't have too big an influence on the overall estimates. Finally, in the last step of the methodology, we calculate the overall volume safely treated by multiplying together the proportions safely treated from step three by the volumes generated for each step coming from step two. Then the safely treated volumes for the sewer and septic tank streams are summed and we calculate the proportion of wastewater safely treated as the total safely treated divided by the total generated to give us the country estimates. So if we move to the results, uh, on the right-hand side here, you can see at the global level, uh, the breakdown of estimated household wastewater generation, where we see 57% of wastewater generated by households with sewer connections, 24% uh, by those with septic tanks, and 19% by those with all other types of sanitation. And then to the left, if you look across the SDG regions, you see that uh, sewer wastewater is dominant in most regions, uh, but that in Central and Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, septic tanks and other forms of sanitation are more common. And we were able to produce estimates of wastewater generation for all 234 countries uh, and territories that uh, the UN Population Division produces population statistics for. Well, now if we look to the proportion that ends up safely treated at the global level, um, we estimated that just about half, 56% of all household flows were safely treated in 2020. But it's clear that there's a lot of variability between regions with a low proportion of safely treated flows in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Central and Southern Asia, and to some extent in Latin America and the Caribbean. And these estimates on safely treated proportions could be derived for 128 uh, countries, that's 55% of countries, but it includes some large ones so that it covers about 80% of the wastewater flows and 84% of the global population. And again, when we were talking about safely treated, we're looking for compliance with effluent standards if that's available. And if it's not, then we use um, secondary treatment or better as a proxy. Um, this slide shows the breakdown of collected and safely treated flows, looking at the sewer and septic tank streams individually. Within the sewer stream, about 10% of flows weren't collected, 12% were collected but not safely treated, and 78% were both collected and safely treated. Uh, so the majority of flows into sewers were therefore safely treated. But within septic tanks, um, a lot of the flows just weren't collected or there weren't data that uh, septic tanks were effectively containing wastes. And we know that especially in low and middle income countries, a lot of what's called septic tanks uh, are actually just holding tanks that don't provide treatment, but um, a little bit of solids removal and then discharge basically raw sewage into open drains. So that's why you see such a high proportion of uh, not collected uh, wastewater in the septic tank stream. Okay, well, uh, for those of you who would like more uh, information, please visit the website. Um, we also have uh, a methodological note and country files for each of the 234 countries that summarize all of the country specific data. They show what assumptions were used, where data were missing, and you can find all of these resources at the UN Water SDG 6 website. 
Thanks very much. Back to you, Florian. Thank you very much, Rick. That was great. And thanks for joining and for all the work that we did together during the last two years. It was really great. And uh, it's a different methodology, but very complementary. And if it's clearly explained, I think it's, it's comprehensive. But uh, because first it was, it could be a bit surprising that we are doing this different approach. But I think it makes a lot of sense based on all your experience with GMP and all the data that you have and considering the relative lack of uh, wastewater statistics that are currently reported um, to the database. So we can discuss about all of this uh, after the last presentation. I don't see uh, some comment or, or question at the chat box. Please do not hesitate. And uh, we'll, I will give now the floor to Dimitri. That's also really great, as I said in the introduction, to have someone from a, a, a city, and especially a, a city of the size of uh, New York. So thank you very much, Dimitri, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, uh, for having me. Just want to uh, confirm with you that I do that you can see my presentation because I can't tell here. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. So um, I serve uh, the city of New York uh, within the Department of uh, Environmental Protection. Uh, I serve the uh, Wastewater Treatment uh, Bureau uh, as the director for uh, treatment, uh, wastewater resource recovery uh, operations. So um, this is a, a slightly different perspective from the conversation that uh, we've been having uh, up to this point uh, in that um, I'm hoping to uh, actually provide you uh, with a look at a, a relatively mature city and the type of challenges that uh, we face. So a little bit first about uh, the system in uh, New York City. Um, it is uh, one of the largest systems around, uh, certainly in the U.S. Um, we have about 6,000 employees, uh, a budget uh, of a little bit over uh, a billion dollars a year. Uh, we do provide both water and wastewater services. Uh, we're also uh, mandated uh, with the air, noise, and hazardous waste components. Uh, water supply side, uh, we these days we provide about a billion gallons of water. Um, population of about 9 million uh, New Yorkers. And, uh, well, courtesy of COVID, that number is a little smaller now in terms of the, uh, the transient population. We typically have 2 to 3 million people a day uh, that come into New York City to work and then leave. Uh we have a, a very large watershed uh, upstate where our drinking water comes from, about uh, 2,000 square miles of watershed, 19 reservoirs and controlled lakes uh, that we use uh, for, uh, for storage. On the wastewater treatment side, which is uh, my end of the, the business, um, we treat about 1.3 billion gallons, and I apologize uh, to everyone outside of the U.S. Uh, for my my numbers. I'm going to try to uh, put in some cubic meters per day numbers there to help get a sense of uh, uh, volumes. Uh, but um, we, we treat about 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater a day. Uh, that number actually has gone down uh, significantly over the past 20 years thanks to water conservation efforts, even though the population of the city has increased. Uh, 14 treatment plants, as we'll see in a minute, um, about 100 pump stations, and uh, over 7,500 miles of sewers. Uh, and then additionally, we also enforce the uh, air, noise, and hazardous waste code. So that's a, a high-level overview of the city, but then on the wastewater treatment side, it's a, it's a pretty decently sized uh, system. Uh, 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities that uh, cover the city, uh, five uh, dewatering facilities that produce biosolids uh, that are now um, either landfilled or uh, land applied beneficially, uh, 100 pump stations, 500 regulators almost, and four uh, combined sewer overflow storage facilities. New York City, like many old cities, has a, a predominantly combined system where wastewater and stormwater are conjoined. And that is part of our uh, significant challenges that we meet have to meet today. Uh, we also provide aeration in two locations in order to uh, keep the uh, dissolved oxygen levels elevated in specific uh, streams that have been um, 
managed uh, over the years, and basically we've uh, cut off fresh water into them, so we have to provide aeration to keep the biology going. Uh, five laboratories, uh, small Navy. Uh, we have 17 uh, vessels that we use to manage uh, solids and uh, do harbor surveys, about 1,800 staff. Uh, 1,600 of those staff are um, in the operation side. The rest are uh, in engineering. So with that, uh, in terms of the, the facilities, uh, looking at uh, where we are uh, in, uh, in, in New York, and I'm just going to point to um, uh, the city, the, the five boroughs. Uh, among the boroughs, we do have some interesting water bodies. Uh, the, uh, here in the north of the city, the Long Island Sound, where we uh, have a, a sensitive, um, slightly eutrophic uh, water body that we have to contend with and um, help manage uh, the nutrient discharges into that uh, water body, but also Jamaica Bay uh, here in the south, uh, a second water body uh, that we have to manage nutrient levels too. And by nutrients, I mean uh, nitrogen. Uh, we are a... Uh, 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 an ocean discharger, effectively, so nitrogen is our uh, limiting nutrient. The 14 plants are scattered, for lack of a better word, uh, throughout the city. Uh, a very decentralized system was the choice that was made um, over 100 years ago, and uh, we still have uh, to this day. And this does present a challenge to us, especially as the level of treatment that we need to provide has increased uh, over the past uh, 20 years with nitrogen removal now being at the core of the facilities that discharge into the, um, the eight facilities that discharge into these uh, particularly sensitive water bodies. Uh, all the facilities achieve secondary treatment or better, uh, but as we'll see, uh, some of them are really, really constrained in terms of space uh, and uh, that is one of the, the hallmarks of the New York City plants. Um, although they do achieve uh, high levels of treatment, uh, space is an issue. And so there's uh, been uh, a fair amount of process modifications that have been made over the years to be able to um, achieve those high levels of treatment uh, in very tight spaces. So you will see a lot of uh, high rate processes uh, present. In terms of... Um, the dry weather capacity of the 14 plants, uh, we're at about 1.8 billion gallons a day, uh, about 7 million cubic meters uh, per day of uh, capacity. We actually flow at about uh, 1.2 roughly billion gallons a day, so about uh, 5 million uh, cubic meters per day. But during wet weather, as we noted earlier, it's a combined sewer system. Uh, we try to capture as much of the flow as we can so we'll uh, readily go up to uh, 15 to 18 uh, million cubic meters per day during wet weather. And uh, we still have uh, some uh, flow that goes out in directly into the water bodies uh, through a combined sewer uh, overflow system through the regulators that we discussed. Uh, we do have some sanitary only systems, uh, some of the newer systems that were deployed in the 50s and 60s are uh, sanitary only down here in the south and now the Rockaways. Uh, but for the most part, we're working with combined sewer systems. Uh, our treatment facilities um, are pretty conventional in some ways. Uh, the conventional wastewater uh, resource recovery uh, process trains are uh, what uh, we have for the most part. Uh, what makes these facilities unique, though, is just the amount of mass that goes through them and also the, the size. So um, in terms of uh, the processing rates, uh, we refer to these as high rate um, uh, processes because we have typically about uh, three to four hours of detention time in the biological process uh, versus the eight to 12 uh, hours that we typically encounter in most biological processes. So uh, very high rate units, uh, which means that um, we, uh, we were running these plants uh, with a minimal safety factor. 
uh, on the biological side of things, and thus uh, a high level of oversight is required. And frankly, when something goes wrong, there's not much time to respond. So uh, the uh, level of monitoring that has to be conducted is pretty significant. And that is actually one of the areas that we're focusing our, our energies these days, enhancing the level of monitoring and um, trying to increase the, uh, through digi digitization, trying to increase the times that we have in order to respond to issues as they occur. Now, in terms of maintaining, um, you know, the level of service that we have been uh, providing uh, as the system has been growing, as the city has been growing uh, over uh, the past uh, almost 120 years now, um, uh, with uh, the first facilities actually going in in the late uh, 1800s. Um, our system is seeing some significant pressures these days. Um, Certainly, uh, although it's a mature system, there's a fair amount of development occurring in uh, both uh, relatively mature portions of the city, but also in uh, portions of the city that uh, historically had not uh, seen uh, much development, as uh, we do have, as uh, many uh, U.S. cities do, a, uh, a significant uh, demand on housing. Um, Climate change, uh, sea level rise, we are a coastal city, um, but uh, not just sea level rise, as we saw from uh, uh, the remnants of Ida just uh, a little over a month ago, precipitation rate and intensity uh, posing uh, new challenges into the system, a system that does have, for the most part, a fair amount of aging infrastructure that is beyond any expectation in terms of the life uh, that uh, we've been able to extract out of it. And then lastly, staffing issues um, are also uh, a significant concern for us as uh, our workforce is changing. So it's really a mature, growing uh, urban system. Um, as I noted earlier, we have infrastructure that uh, dates from the late 1800s in terms of sewers, uh, uh, early 1900s. Uh, the uh, bulk of our treatment plants and pump stations were actually first deployed in the 1920s and 1930s. And for the most part, we've just been trying to grow on uh, those sites. Um, so we are, uh, we've reached a point now where there's just no more room to grow. And we are looking at uh, new facilities, uh, consolidation opportunities, and really rethinking the decentralized model that had been implemented uh, more than a century ago now. And then on the new development site, uh, you know, to the uh, conversation that's occurring today, um, we have a lot of construction going on across the city. And uh, anytime there's a uh, new construction, uh, the, the human element uh, does uh, interject. Um, we have had a fair amount of uh, uh, improper connections, uh, folks uh, connecting into stormwater systems, for example, rather, rather than sewage systems. And some of these connections can be quite large in the millions of gallons per day that uh, we have to track down um, and then uh, have corrections rapidly apply. Um, at times we've had as many as 20 major connections per year uh, that um, uh, from large developments where uh, those uh, connections were made into the wrong system. I know it's hard to believe, but uh, it does occur. Uh, and we, for that reason, we have a very uh, robust, enhanced, um, illicit discharge detection system to locate those uh, connections and uh, go ahead and implement uh, changes. Uh, we use everything from uh, good old fashioned uh, methods such as dye testing uh, to microbial source tracking uh, using uh, fingerprinting to uh, try to track down when there's sewage uh, in the streams uh, versus human sewage uh, versus animal sewage. Uh, animal uh, droppings, uh, because we, we have had over the years uh, an increase in uh, the wildlife as um, uh, we've been naturalizing uh, sections of uh, the uh, the waterfront. So uh, a mature but growing system that is seeing a lot of pressure from sea level rise and uh, increased precipitation intensity. Uh, most of our focus to date has actually been on uh, sea level rise and uh, exposure of our facilities to these higher um, uh, levels of uh, storm surges, for example, we have come to realize 
that uh, that is really just the beginning. Unfortunately, uh, we also have to contend with cloud bursts and significant wet weather events. To uh, that effect, uh, we uh, we are looking at our our system, but also our mandate, frankly, um, in terms of you know to what degree can we uh, within our existing uh, political structures and um, uh, uh, charter the the charter of the utility can we deal with it or do we need um, uh, authorization to uh, go further uh, than our previous mandate, which was historically been just treat the wastewater. Uh, we are seeing that now we're, uh, you know, you could see a situation where we become a mini water board of sorts uh, in a more integrated manner uh, rather than uh, what we have historically been uh, charged with. Staffing is a, a key issue for us. Um, our workforce is uh, aging out. Um, we need new competencies, and we have to do all that within a municipal sector, which means that um, we do have some challenges there. Uh, in order to uh, to work uh, through. But that said, there's a lot of opportunity still there. Um, uh, there's We've made some significant um, uh, strides over the past uh, just two or three years as uh, we're pivoting our industries, uh, the few industries that still exist in New York City, but we do have a couple uh, of large industrial dischargers um, using our sewer use regulations, using the uh, regs that we already have, and um, also uh, pushing a little bit gently, nudging um, by defining stewardship expectations of our industrial components so that we can uh, look at them as resources rather than as pollutants. And for example, we've diverted the airport de-icing fluid, uh, which historically had just gone to the bay untreated, now to the treatment plants where we're using it in lieu of supplemental carbon to drive the nitrogen removal process. So we're using it as a resource. Similarly, brewery discharges, uh, which uh, folks have been dumping to the sewer and causing all kinds of problems in the uh, sewers with blockages, we've pushed them on uh, to go directly uh, to digesters, get collected, go to digestion, so they can actually be used for renewable natural gas production from our biogas rather than being just a headache. Um, and then on the residential and commercial flows, with all the growth that's occurring, uh, now we're targeting uh, really the extension of the lifespan of the existing infrastructure because getting in there and expanding sewers is just not realistic given the number of um, uh, conflicts that exist. So we're looking to reduce the organics and or nutrient loadings by uh, diverting food waste from the sewer system directly to the digestion facilities, uh, looking for on-site wastewater management opportunities, everything from equalization so that we can, um, uh, large developments can discharge their flows at night uh, when the diurnal loading is lower, uh, to uh, urine separation uh, uh, with struvite uh, generation so that we can reduce the amount of nitrogen going to the facilities. Uh, while we look at uh, the utility's role um, in terms of the resiliency impact, as I noted earlier, what is going to be our role in managing the resiliency against sea level rise and uh, high flows uh, due to wet weather, uh, and even heat recovery as we look at our wastewater as a uh, potential heat source uh, for uh, the city. And with that, I'd like to uh, turn it back um, to the, uh, the presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really a, a great, great presentation and huge volume. That's really impressive. And also the challenges regarding climate change and um, yeah, the quality of the treatment. We Usually with the tendencies is more to, to, to regroup and to close some uh, wastewater treatment plan to improve the, the treatment level. So I was really impressed and also in, so interested about the, the, the climate change issue and the fact that the volume of wastewater decreased despite uh, the increasing population and the increasing precipitation. So I may have some, maybe some remark, but first I would like to, to see if there are any questions in the room because it's almost time, but I know we may have, may have four, five minutes. So is there any question in the room or from the audience or from the presenters? Nobody, no question. So, Dimitri, could you uh, tell tell me how is it possible that despite uh, 
the increased precipitation combined severe increasing uh, population that uh, the wastewater uh, volume decrease over the last years. Uh, it was a, um, a really concerted effort um, in terms of uh, rebates for water conservation fixtures, um, metering, and actually having folks pay for their water for the first time uh, based on how much they actually used rather than the square footage of their house. Um, it really helped uh, drive uh, a, a sense of conservation. And really, it was this conservation effort that allowed us to achieve nutrient control uh, in plants with uh, very low detention times. And as I was saying earlier, three and four hour biological uh, treatment uh, detention times, allowing us to still achieve um, eight to 10 milligram per liter uh, effluent nitrogen levels uh, from these plants. Without those conservation efforts, uh, we would have been in the two to three hour detention times, which would have made it, um, uh, even for us, uh, practically impossible to achieve nutrient control. So uh, that uh, accounted uh, to almost $10, million, $10 billion, pardon me, not million, $10 billion in savings um, because it allowed us to avoid having to stack process units uh, and uh, look for new facilities, locations for facilities. So uh, it's worked very well with the water conservation measures. That's great. That's great. And also the, the methane and the I mean, there is a, an adaptation to climate change and uh, also mitigation by this production of methane. And that's really nice to see at this such a huge scale for us because the volume, I'm also not an, an expert in gallon, but uh, it's on the next development about our indicators. Or do you want to, to ask something to Dimitri? Or? Well, I also thought it was a really fascinating presentation, Dimitri. Thanks. Yeah so much. I was really interested to hear about the impact that climate change is having on your systems and what, what you're seeing both as the future activities and, and the future mandate, as you pointed out, maybe the role, maybe your role would evolve or maybe someone else needs to step in, with, but there, there are new functions that are needed and um, how do those get addressed going forward, I think is, is really relevant um, for all of us. As far as the, the global reporting goes, um, we, we published the indicator report back in August, and we're aiming to update it regularly every couple of years or so. So uh, maybe in a couple of years, we could highlight um, New York as a, as a good practice because in the reports, we, we, we crunch all the numbers, but we also like to give concrete examples of where countries are doing innovative things or notable practices. And it seems like you're, you're achieving a lot in New York. So congratulations. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really, I'm very sorry because I see in my chat that we have to finish because there is a next session that to be prepared. So we will just make a, a little bit longer. But uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry that we cannot continue the discussion. I hope that it was interesting and that it could bring the, the data perspective into this uh, water operator partnership and with such a, a great example for New York. Thank you very much to all the participants and presenter and. Uh, a great thanks and a continuation on this uh, great Congress. Thank you, Thank you and goodbye. What? Already over? No, we have plenty more options to continue the discussions and peer exchange beyond the Congress. Tell me more, what are the options? Well, Shiwopa membership, for example. By becoming a member of Shiwopa, everyone can connect to a global alliance of practitioners and experts. There are two ways of becoming a member. First, institutional members. Institutions can participate in Shiwopa's assemblies and are eligible to run and vote in its international steering committee elections. Or second, individual members. Individuals can connect and engage with peers in the online Shiwopa community. We have created a space that allows for networking and easy communication. With future work partners, stay up to date on project opportunities and participate in peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities. Sounds great. How can I join? Simply go to www.shiwopa.org and register for free. If you want to know more, you can follow Shiwopa on social media and subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks for joining the fourth Global Talks Congress. We'll see you soon.